And uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the changing weather. It's been nice for it to be a little bit cooler. Um, thank you for the diversity of people in this room uh, from all different walks of life, all different places, different parts of the world. Um, it's a joy for me to see that. I think it's encouraging for all of us. Lord, as we open your word this morning, uh, we pray that we would be soft, that we would be listening to what your plan is, and that we would be humble and looking at that, and also understanding, Lord, that your instructions are good. They're good because you designed us, you made us, and you know exactly how we operate. And so the, the instructions that you've given us for life and our families can be trusted to be useful, and that more than useful, absolutely essential. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. We're going to be in Ephesians 5 today, starting in verse 22. We're going to sort of go through 33. Like I already <coughs> said, uh, the, the sermon on spiritual leadership, we've done that one. So if you want the sermon about spiritual leadership, you need to go back to the video and, and look at that. That isn't particularly the topic. But we are going to talk about family relationships between genders, specifically husbands and wives. And in the midst of that, there's a very simple but important truth. Men and women are not the same. We're going to delve into that a little bit more, but we're not. Um, but before we even talk about that, I'm once again, we've been reminded about this passage over and over, and I'm just going to keep harping on it. Ephesians 5.21, go back one verse. And if you haven't found Ephesians yet, it's towards the back, maybe, I don't know, three quarters, a bit further. Here's what Ephesians 5.21 says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. God's plan is for us as the church to, to operate in a humility with one another, period. With everybody. That's, that's, the, that's the base standard. And so as God starts to give us more instructions, it's greater explanation of how to submit to one another. But the instructions are different because we're different. The Bible talks some about how we are different, not as much as maybe, maybe the Bible kind of assumes we know we're different. One of the passages would be 1 Peter 3, 7. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, You husbands likewise live with your wives in an understanding way, as with a weaker vessel, and she is a woman, and grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. There's a fantastic sermon there that I'm not going to preach today. And the weaker vessel is a somewhat unfortunate translation. It, should, it sounds a little bit more like this. Hey, you big hunk and clay pot, remember that your wife is made out of porcelain and looks really nice and has a different value and different use than you, big hunk and clay pot. That's more the feel of what we're talking about here. It isn't, it isn't a weaker vessel as in you're less capable. It's a man, you big hunkin' thing, be careful of your beautiful porcelain wife who has great value. Don't shatter her. We're going to talk about that some today. Of course, the most obvious way that men and women are different is that uh, women make babies. And men don't make babies. You know, there's been some stuff in the headlines about man has baby or whatever, but they always were women first before whatever happened happened. And there is no examples of men having children. And then men in general are stronger, faster, more aggressive. Uh, the world records in weightlifting, the 100 meter dash, judo, are all men. 
Uh, in America, we're running into this new problem of we have teenagers that have decided that they want to change genders, and then they change genders, and they want to do sports with the new gender, and guess what's happening? The boys win all the time, or the former boys, or however you want to phrase the phrase. It doesn't change. It doesn't change the fact that they were still born with greater muscle mass, different bone density. The different it doesn't change that. And so we're trying to figure out as a country how we're going to make it fair that these people are supposed to compete when there isn't a good competition. Uh, I come from a world where um, even something as simple as firing a weapon. You know, that doesn't depend on, on strength or speed. And yet with the same amount of training and the same amount of experience, if they're both highly experienced, men outshoot women. That's a fact. Here's another interesting fact, though. Um, if you have a bunch of new people that have never shot before, a mixture of men and women, the women uh, can shoot expert much faster on, on a rule than the guys do. You know why? Because they don't have male ego in the way. All the guys come at the gun and say, I know how to do this, and they don't actually listen. And all the ladies are like, yeah, you just tell me what to do. And then they do really good. So the, the curve of improvement, the women become much better at shooting faster. But ultimately, statistically, when you get down to it, there's still a difference. The differences don't stop with what we're capable of physically, and maybe even with some of the cause. You may have heard this before. When a man is being developed in the womb, so he's still a baby, he's not a man yet, he's just a, an embryo, he's a baby, he's, we, call, we consider people in the womb babies, and he's developing. Some point in his development, his brain's been developing, it's doing great, it's, it's getting stronger, and a wash of testosterone goes through their skull. You know what that wash of testosterone does? It destroys about 30% of the connections between the two hemispheres of the brain. Yeah, men are brain damaged, right? They, they started out with the capacity that they lost. I don't know why that happens. It happens to all of us. Every single one of us in the womb, we're growing, we're getting bigger, and then there's this wash that kills a third of the connections between the right hemisphere. And this changes the way we handle situation, it changes the way we think, it changes the way, it changes us forever. <coughs> Not only a brain damage, but male ego is real, right? So not only are we brain damaged, we're proud of it. That's us. Brain damaged and proud. Meanwhile, in women who do not get brain damage in the womb, have a baby making system. And that baby making system is controlled by hormones. Now, emotions and personality are affected by hormones. I know this, a few years back, my thyroid quit working. It quit working very, very badly. It like, <laughs> And the depression and the inability to handle basic problems and just sleeping all the time and totally being emotionally messed up was an after effect of the hormonal shift in my body. When hormones change, it affects our personality and the way we think. It's funny, speaking of the whole gender situation um, and, and how hormones affect who we are. I was reading an article uh, a couple years ago about a woman who wanted to be a man. And so, uh, you know, it's the whole, I really want to be a man, so then they give her male hormones, and they finally get the hormones, the testosterone, up to the level that would be a typical man. Here's what she complained about immediately. All day long, I think about sex. Like, I can't turn it off. How do I deal with this? Yeah, well, isn't that ironic? 
isn't this how it goes? You know, I, I feel like a man, so I need to be a man. No, you don't feel like a man. No, I do feel like a man. No, no, you, you don't feel like a man. I feel like a man, make me a man. Okay, fine, we give you this time. Wow, do I feel different? Just an interesting thought. Hormones change the way we feel, the way we act, our focus. They have an effect on us. It's real. And I've discovered something interesting. Women are allowed to talk about this openly, and men are not. So I have five daughters and a wife. And you know what they're allowed to do? Girl, you just need to chill out. You know it's that time. You know what I'm saying? Just, now, my daughters can say that to each other, and that's okay. If I say that, well, I can't say that, right? So if my wife says anything, honey, am I moody? No, you are not moody. No, no. You're great. You're fantastic. Everything is lovely. You're lovely. So women, women are allowed to, to do this, but men are allowed. In fact, I think every man in the room is like, what are you doing, Keith? You can't say that. We're all going to pay. We're all going to go home and you just talked about this. You can't talk about Here's the thing. It isn't just that. It isn't just a monthly thing. Uh, from the time my wife got pregnant to about six months after she got pregnant, I swear she was seven different people. <laughs> she, she just kept changing who she was. Why? Because the hormonal things that were controlling the whole baby-making operation changed her personality over and over. And now she's over 50. And that means we, well, there's no predictability whatsoever. If you come in our house and you go, it is absolutely freezing in here, do not say anything. It's because we suddenly needed, the house was too hot. You just understand, the house was too hot right now. It had to get colder. Just, okay. <clears throat> so men are brain damaged and proud of it. And women are periodically chemically insane. And this is the life we have. This is, this, is our, this is our thing that we have to do together. And so the man comes home one day and the woman's at the kitchen table crying. Honey, why are you crying? I don't know why I'm crying. The man doesn't get it. Why? He's brain damaged. So he's like, I don't get that. I would know why I was crying. Then male ego kicks in. I'm sure glad I'm not a woman. I think I'll go fishing. Well, he's gone. Meanwhile, the woman is left at the kitchen table going, why doesn't he love me? And this is the situation that God is speaking into. The instructions here are speaking into that. And it's intercultural. It's not just west or east. I think this is like universal stuff here. And so in this situation, God starts to speak. So we're going to start, he starts with women. I think the reason he starts with women is because women are a lot easier. Like this is the easier one. So he starts with women, and it starts with verse 22 of Ephesians chapter 5. It says, women be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being savior of the body, that as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject uh, ought to be to their husbands in everything. I'm not sure I said that correctly. <coughs> but as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. First of all, I just want you to compare verse 21 and 22. 21 says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. 22 says, wives be subject to our husbands as to the Lord. Notice how similar they are. Why? And then when you get to the men, it doesn't sound similar at all. Because, you see, the women get it a lot faster than the guys do. God's got to be far more specific with the guys. Like, okay, guys, you're just not going to get this being subject thing. I'm going to have to really rework this. 
But with the gals, he's just direct. We're all supposed to be subject to each other. Okay, ladies, be subject to your husbands. Get it? Now, a key word, though, is own. Uh, the NIV doesn't have the word own. Most other translations do in verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands. I think that word belongs there, and I think it's an important word. And here's why I think it's important. When our husband, and I'm not a lady, so I'm kind of speaking out of body experience here. When the husband is not playing well, it can be tempting to find another one. And I don't necessarily mean physically find another one. And you can find another emotional one. Sometimes Dr. Phil on TV can be the husband I'm really looking for. He's kind and considerate and he says nice things. Or there could be a pastor that you find online or somewhere else and you decide that's going to be your spiritual leader because your husband's not doing the job. Or I could be unknowingly a person that you're going to for that feedback, but it, it isn't your husband anymore. Don't do that. When your husband doesn't seem to be interested in being the spiritual leader, the best thing that you can do is ask him spiritual questions. Involve him in your spiritual walk. Don't hound him to read his Bible. Ask him questions that drive him to his Bible. Go to him and ask him to spiritually lead. And don't just say the words, honey, I'd like you to spiritually lead me. Come to him with spiritual issues and say, please lead me. Please give me input. Please help me move forward. Please help me understand. Even if you think you know better than he does. Remember that male ego thing. He wants to lead. He wants to be important. He wants to be involved. He wants to be in this. So give him a chance. Speaking of ego and men and wives, let's look at verses 23 and 24. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands and everything. This whole thing is supposed to be a team identity. I'm going to talk quite a bit here in a second about team and why teamwork is important to men, maybe more so than some of you as women. But let's look at Genesis chapter 1. That's way at the beginning. First book of the Bible, we're going to go at the very beginning, the, even the first chapter. Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 through 31. This is what it reads. And God created man in his own image. In the men, image of God, I should say mankind there, by the way. And God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created mankind. Male and female, he created them. That's why I'm using the word mankind, because he's anything specific about gender. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. You cannot do that alone, guys. That takes both of you. Fill the earth, that takes both of you. And subdue it. Why do we think that subduing it is somehow a man's job? The first two things weren't a man's job. The first two things were things we did together. We were fruitful and multiplied together. We filled the world together. So we're going to subdue it together. And rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the, every living thing that moves on the earth. We're going to do it together. And then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed and every beast. And by the time we get to verse 31, it says, God saw that all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Notice that his statement of very good comes after he has made man and woman. Yes, man and woman have been created, they're together, they're a team, and that is very good. Now it is true that God made man first. And when I say man, I mean male first. If we move over one more page to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. This is what we read. This, now God has already made Adam, but he has not made Eve yet. It says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, From every tree in the garden you may free, freely, 
But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. I want you to notice something. The woman isn't alive yet. She's not even created. She didn't hear this. God gave an instruction to Adam, and it was Adam's responsibility to, to now convey that information to Eve. That was his job. He was supposed to do that. If there's any error, I've, I've heard some interesting things later about people going over the whole thing with the serpent and how when the serpent asked about the tree and Eden, uh, Eve didn't answer exactly the words that God spoke and maybe giving, giving Eve some of the blame for that. You know what? How do we know that was Eve's fault? How do we know Adam didn't exactly convey the message straight? If there's an error in the way that Eve responded, how do we know it is because Adam decided to add to it? Adam was told not to eat of it. Maybe Adam trying to make sure Eve didn't get any close, we're close and said, we're not supposed to eat from that tree, don't even touch it. We don't know what Adam added. But what we know is that God gave the instruction to Adam. He wasn't even there. And then we get the first not good statement of the entire Bible. I mean, so far everything else has been good. In verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. It is not good yet. I will make him a helper, suitable. And then out of the ground, God formed beasts and of the field, and, and Adam got a chance to name the animals. He did that before Eve was created. And then God made Eve. And he says of this in verse 23, this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And that's what God said was good. God said that was very good. So God made Adam who was incomplete. Then he made Eve, and they were good. And together they were the team that God designed, and they were already different, but together they were good. The difference was good. And that's one of the things that we've got to embrace in our understanding of how God made us. The difference isn't bad. It's good. But... In difference, there's potential for conflict. And in conflict, there's potential for the team to fall apart. Now here's the thing about teamwork that I want you to, to take away. I was talking with some women from uh, mothers of preschoolers is something we do in the military to help moms with little kids that are going nuts because little kids are difficult. And once a year, they allow a guy to talk to the moms people. I don't know why that tradition is. And one year, they picked me to be the guy that got to talk to moms, women. And they said, you can talk on anything you want. I said, okay. What could I talk about? Well, sure is a lot easier to manage preschoolers if you're getting on with your husband good. If you're working together as a team, it's a lot easier. Maybe I'll talk about that. This is what I told the ladies, and they all went, oh yeah, you're right. Your husband, or the man in your life, or men in general, want to win. At everything. All the time. They want to win. Some men have a more sophisticated de definition of what winning looks like, so they might come across as more sensitive or kind or whatever, but they make no mistake. All men, all the time, want to win. Now, here's what you never ever want it to be, ladies. You never want it to become a competition between you and your husband. Ever. Let me tell you why you never want it to be a competition between you and your husband. None of the outcomes are good. If your husband uses his emotional strength or his physical strength or intellectual arguments or whatever it is he uses and he beats you, he wins against you. Well, that's not good because now I, I'm just kind of there and I'm with the wife and my husband has won again and I'm just going to do what he asked me to do. 
That's not what we're looking for. If you win, you've crushed that male ego. You ladies all know that we're all, all the guys are saying, I don't think I have one of those. All of these are like, yeah, you do. So when you win, you've kicked that male ego. Now you can keep it, kick it, and you can kick it, and you can kick it. And once it becomes clear he cannot win, he will change sports into something he can win. He'll change to drinking. He's really good at winning in drinking. Or he'll win at video games. Or he can win at fishing. Or he can win at surfing. Or he can win at work. Or he can work, win at intellectual advance work. Or he can win at some other thing. But if he can't win at home, he'll quit trying to win at home. He'll find somewhere else to win. If your standard for your husband is so high that no matter what he does, it still hasn't been good enough, you have made an environment that he is eventually going to despise. He will hate being there. How do you get on the same team as your husband so that you can win together? See, that's the picture, that's how this works. How it works is you get on the same team as your husband, and then it's not him winning or you winning, you both win together. This is the big secret of how to deal with your guy. What are his goals? What are his dreams? Can you explain your goals and dreams in a way that captures his interest and his imagination so he starts to take on some of those goals and dreams? He wants so badly to be respected. And I'm just gonna get raw here. I want to be respected. I'm a man and I want to be respected. It's how I'm built, it's the way I am. I want to be treated respectfully. And I want to be, and I want to win. I do. I do want to win. <coughs> But I want to win with my family. I want to win with my wife and my kids all together as one team, moving forward and winning together. I want us to win. When my wife helps me to understand how to be on her team, I respect that. When she supports me, even when I make a mistake, it is so valuable. When she is there for me, even when I fall down. When, when she makes sure that the standard that she has for me is not so high that I constantly feel like a failure. I constantly feel like I can't, I can't live up to the standard she has for what a great man is. When she does that, then I feel the way I'm supposed to feel. So God gives these instructions for the care and feeding of a husband who wants to win so that you can win together. <clears throat> and God acknowledges that the man was first and he was giving leadership and he's asking the woman to work within the framework he created. It's not because one is better than the other. And like I said, I've already preached a sermon on spiritual leadership and all that applies to. Men, I'm turning to you now. Notice that God did not have to tell your wife to love you. It's completely missing. It's not even there. Wives be subject. Yeah. That's it. Really simple. Really almost a, just a simple recap of verse 21. What does he got to tell us? immediately to do love our wives why do we have to be told that <clears throat> well I was talking with somebody recently about agape love agape love uh, is a Greek word um, it's not something that came out of Christianity into Greek it's something that went from Greek into Christianity so it already had a meaning and you know what? Agape was not a word that the Greeks ascribed to their gods. The gods were selfish, 
um, erotic, um, otherwise very simple human type beings that didn't have a lot of fantastic personal attributes. The place in Greek literature where we see the word agape most often is in women with their children. Women unconditionally love their kids. Not all of them, not every time. This is the broken world. I'm not saying that every woman ever has had agape love for their kids. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you're looking for a physical manifestation and an example in nature of what agape love means, that means love without any conditions, the closest you're going to get to God's love for us is that, that incredibly intense, self-sacrificing love that a woman has for her kids. That's as close as it gets. Guys, I have met women who were treated so badly by their husbands for years and still love them. And still love their husbands. Despite being just trampled over and over and over. And yet, they still love him. And it's painful. It's painful to talk with those women who sincerely love that man and they, and they wonder and they pray, when am I ever gonna get any of it back? You see, here's where we get confused when our wives say things like, you don't love me or you don't act like you love me or why don't you love me? Or, and we get lost, and here's where we get lost. We're still trying to win. Like, what are the rules to this game? All right, so how many, so if I, if I give you flowers on every special occasion, <laughs> take you out on a date once a month, and remember my anniversary, is that, is that enough to win? We're, we're looking for some sort of scorecard. We're looking for a formula. If I manage to do this much, is it enough? <laughs> some checklist of, of of love, if I can do this, is that love? What is love? How do I do enough to show you that I love you? In fact, I've heard that exact phrase, talking to men and women, and the man going, I just don't know how to do enough things to make my wife feel like I love her. The problem is you have the complete wrong concept of what love is from the get-go. It isn't something that there's rules for. There's no list of things you can do. There's no threshold that if I can get up above that, then it's love. Here's what love is, guys. It's a permanent fixture of your life. It just lives there, and it never leaves. And every decision you make always goes through the filter of how will this affect my wife? Will it meet her needs? Will it hurt her? Will it harm her? Is this what my family needs me to do? All of them. All of them. It's an attitude. It's a choice. It's a decision. It's the way we set up our life. And so we're still thinking, well, how much more do I have to do to prove to you that I love you? And the woman's going, what is wrong with you? That isn't what it's about. And so we have these arguments, and we're talking a different language, and we don't even get what we're talking about. Because when a woman, if you want that perfect example, when a good mom looks at her kids, She's not keeping track of how much good stuff she did for them. She makes every decision about how is it going to affect my baby. Do I need to work more? Do, I, do they need more time? Do I need, need better food? Do they need more protection? They don't turn it off. It doesn't ever turn off. It's a constant attitude of what does my life do in response to that child. That doesn't mean giving the child everything that they want. And guys, Giving our wives everything they want isn't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about never turning off the filter that I make decisions with my wife's best interest in mind because I love her. Now, the example is how Christ loves the church. Do you think Christ ever turns off his attitude of what's best for the church? Do you think he ever shuts that down?
Our love for our wives is not a game we can win. It's not a victory. There's no scoreboard. It's not a competition. And I know it's hard for our brain damaged brains to get this. <clears throat> Guys, you're to be just as submissive to your wife's needs as she is supposed to be to yours. It's just that God used different terms and assigned different levels of responsibility. <coughs> and you are the one held to the higher standard. Because this passage doesn't say that women have to emulate Christ in quite the same way it says that men have to. It isn't that we shouldn't all emulate Christ. That's not what I'm trying to say. But if there is a higher standard, it is on the men. <clears throat> so I can see it going on in your head. I can see what's, what's in here. So, uh, so I can't go surfing anymore or what? It's a little more complicated than that. Um, Making the decision that's good for our wives. Um, for instance, in my case, I don't go fishing enough. My wife would like me to go fishing more. Because I don't go down to the house, and I don't do what I need to do, and then I kind of get, and she knows that it's good for me to be with other men, and I don't get out enough. So it would be good for my wife if I found more reasons to go out with guys and go do things, because I'm introverted and like that. On the other hand, if she was struggling and she needed to talk and she desperately needed to be with me and I went fishing, that would be flat out wrong. If I couldn't see that, if I couldn't be aware, my life is in trauma. This situation is bad. And if I couldn't stop and say the whole world, uh, no, I'm not going surfing today or I'm not going fishing or whatever, I, my wife needs me. If I can't do that, my capacity to love, my attitude of love is off. So here's what this looks like. When we don't do this, here's what men say. I never seem to be able to win. Nothing I do ever seems good enough. She simply is never satisfied, and I don't even know why I'm trying. And women say, why doesn't he love me? He seems to love the surfboard. He seems to love his other stuff, his boat, his job, whatever. When is he going to love me? When is he going to realize that I'm not an item on his checklist? I'm his wife. When we don't do this, this is what happens in the home. But when we obey God's direction, this is where we get to. The man then gets to say, I always know she's on my side. No matter who else is against me, I know my wife wants me to succeed. Every time I walk in the door, I feel respected and appreciated. And when men do what she, they're supposed to do, this is what women end up saying. He isn't perfect, but he loves me. I don't have to hope that he'll remember me. He thinks of me every time he makes a decision. I feel like the most special person on the world. When we quit trying to make the other person do their bit and we focus on our bit, each side gets exactly what they need to feel safe, secure, and successful. God's instructions are different because we are different. We have different roles sometimes, but we have equal importance. In this passage, this relationship is shown to be a picture of the church's relationship with God. And as much as this can be a fantastic picture, if you've ever seen a good marriage, it is a lovely thing to see a good marriage where both people are happy and secure and they're feeding one another the way they need to be fed. It is a glorious thing. But as nice as that is, it pales in comparison with the relationship God wants to have with us. In our analogy, we will always do our parts imperfectly, but God, in his part, always does it perfectly. God wants a relationship with us. 
He wants that relationship that provides everything that you need for your willingness to submit to his authority. And if you're interested in that kind of relationship with God that can really take care of you, please don't talk to me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've given instruction to men and women in Ephesians because we are different. We experience the world differently. Our needs are different. I am not more important than my wife, and my wife is not more important than me. Lord, I pray that in our families we would begin to realize that it's really a lot less about anything else than it is about helping our partner be the healthiest version of them they can be. That we both need each other. Neither one of us is self-sufficient. Lord, as we look at our relationship with you, would we recognize that your love makes all of our love pale in comparison? That you love is unconditional, and that we can always go to you for strength and encouragement when we're struggling with how to do these things correctly. I pray that you would strengthen us. I pray that you would give us what we lack. So we are capable of doing more than we think. pray that we would have stronger and stronger families within our church. And strong families ultimately make strong churches. So I pray that we would take seriously your instructions for how to make those relationships work well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.